Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm just taking a few moments to let you know that this clip that you will see after this introduction is from one of my online classes, and I've decided to edit them so that more people can benefit from these lectures that I deliver pretty much every week. So enjoy, and let me know what you think about it. Thank you so much. When, when he is talking about tearing out, the, it's not the main narrator, it's still Marlowe. But I think the way it plays out is, in terms of technique, you know, okay, so technically the way the narrative is set is we have one initial setting, right, where we are on a boat, on a ship that is about to embark out, right, and then we are introduced to Marlowe. So what that enables the readers of Conrad at that time to do is to encounter a recurring narrator. Because the moment Marlowe shows up, just like, oh, Marlowe, it's going to be a Marlowe story. Uh, in the hindsight, when we read the novel, since we have read other Marlowe narrated novels too, so we already kind of see him as a familiar. And then the account of Africa and all the encounters till the very end, there is one interruption in section two by the main narrator where he grounds us. So it's kind of technically reminding us this is a story being told within a story. The main merit frame is here is a ship leaving the harbor going into the ocean, right? but then sailors are sitting there and the story is being told. Now, in terms of its implications for Conrad as an author, as I pointed out, that the double frame kind of assures, at least not makes sure, that any of the ideas represented in the novel do not immediately are not immediately read as Conrad's own ideas and belief systems, right? So the first layer is the first narrator, right, who introduced Marlowe. And then the second layer is Marlowe's own narration. So chances are because of that, whatever is represented in the novel is juxtaposed against Marlowe's own sensibilities, his ethics, his morality, and that jump from Marlowe to Conrad would be harder. Now, those of you who have studied literary criticism, you already know that um, uh, T.S. Eliot famously wrote a wonderful essay in which he talks about objective correlative. What he says is that we should not necessarily always assume that things expressed in a story or in a novel are the author's own intentions, that correlative should be objective. Right, we should be able to say, no, this is here, Conrad is crafting a story from a point of view of so and so. So I think that's what the framing works in terms of protecting Conrad, but it, in terms of also grounding the story. Another thing, but the, by staging the story on a ship deck told by a sailor, the story then also falls into the genre of the sailor's tales, right? And so it even makes it more specific. This is not just an adventure story into Africa. This is a sailor's story of sailing in the Congo River. So that even gives it kind of a more specific connotation. That's kind of my understanding of it. Even though at the beginning, the Marlowe Marlo thinks that Kurtz is the only one who is civil, and the only person who actually works in Africa, how come he still sides with Kurtz when he finds out that Kurtz isn't anything like he imagined? Why does he choose Kurtz over the other people at, at the company or the Russian or even the... Good question. Okay, so remember, the early foreshadowing about Kurtz, we don't get a hint that Marlowe believes that Kurtz is all those things. All we are getting is what people are telling him, that Kurtz is exceptional, he is the best, he is being trained. All of all that does is kind of builds up Marlowe's curiosity to meet this person, right? And our curiosity to know Kurtz as readers. Then there is a further foreshadowing there 
staged in the conversation that Marlowe overhears between the st stage man, uh, station manager and his uncle, where he realizes that maybe their interests do not coincide with Curtis's interests. Maybe they are waiting for him to die. So these are also the hints where Marlowe is being told, okay, whose side you are on, right? You might have to choose. And so that's why one could say that Marlowe being an adventurer, Marlowe being not committed to the company, nor are his interests connected to following the company. We also know throughout as, as a narrator that Marlowe doesn't take staunch sides, right? And he's always ambivalent. In one sentence where he is sympathizing with what is being done to the natives, he also uses highly racist vocabularies to describe them. Marlowe is also very skeptical, right, as a narrator, and we, are, we know that he's not religious, right? So at the last minute when he makes that choice, I mean, th the passage is really instructive because he knows that there is no moral reason for him to side with Kurtz, right? But that he decides that he was going to secure Kurtz's Kurt's legacy. And it's, it's implied as if he was commanded. And that command, we don't know where he comes from. But he decides to go along with it. Still calls it that he chooses his own version of darkness, right? So it's not that he, he's thinking that he's making a better choice. But in that nightmare of Congo's Africa, right? Africa's Congo and this rapacious company, that's the nightmare um, that he decides to side with. Um, now, I guess if we did a more careful reading of the novel, you know, maybe we could find like more tactical reasons for him. Okay, so do you believe the way others labeled Marlowe and Kurtz as unsound are influenced by ulterior motives. Okay, so Amy, you mean like the station manager and everyone else, unsound, and then they also use for Kurtz that he transgressed, right? And he has made that sector untenable for the company. Uh, so absolutely, as far as the manager and other company officials are concerned, their purpose is to bring down Kurtz, right? And so that the manager himself can rise in the hierarchy of the company. That's why they're combing through his documents, right? But any negative report that they can send against Kurtz diminishes Kurtz and enhances the station manager's chances of succeeding. Uh, but part of it is also true. I mean, Kurtz, of course, is unsound, right? He is gone crazy. But it suits them if they can prove it, not just that he is unsound, but also that he has damaged company's interest because of his transgressive behavior. And so bureaucratically speaking, there is one way they can say, oh, he's gone loco, he's gone crazy, or he's lost it. But beyond that, they can connect that also to the company's interest. And so then they can have a more convincing case of replacing Kurtz and promoting the station manager. So that conflict between the company officials is throughout, you know, stated in the story. Said here. Um, okay, so keep in mind that nothing in this novella is accidental, right? When a, when a novelist known for writing long novels chooses to write like a 90 page book, and works and works upon it, there is nothing accidental in the novel. Okay, there could be con unconscious slippages, but the, it's a deeply crafted work of fiction. So everything that's in there, we can assume that there is authorial intention behind it. Okay, now I have always thought of it as a racist novel. There is no doubt about that. I, I had a student, uh, in my other class who got slightly agitated because I was not so you know, militantly calling it. A, it's a racist novel, but 
Why do we read it? We need to read it so that we understand how and in how many ways racism is normalized, right? In the works of fiction so that we can understand to untangle them, right? That's one reason I teach Heart of Darkness. But there are other things at play here too. First of all, we know that Conrad himself traveled and actually captained a boat in the Congo River, right? That he took copious notes and some of those notes themselves have deeply racist opinions of Africa, Africans. There is no doubt about that. There is a passage that I cited in one of my articles where he, uh, he writes that he saw an albino African, right? Like a person who had uh, uh, an ailment skin pro pigmentation problem so he was an african but he was white and 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 conrad in his comments calls it ugly right so we can pinpoint in his own travel narrative of congo where he did his research to write the novel that there is no doubt about it that he had racist views right now what makes the novel so complicated is we already know that Marlowe has this view of Africans as prehistoric. We already know that he calls them rudimentary beings, prehistoric beings, which is deeply racist, right? We already know that as we read our Echebe for next week, that by silencing African and by not giving us their voices and their stories in itself is an act of silences and an act of racism, right? Now, what redeems the novel in a way for us, despite being racist, are two things. One, the Europeans themselves in the novel are highly despicable characters, right? And none of them is a likable human being other than maybe the Russian, you know, who's this kind of romantic figure. But pretty much all the Europeans that we encounter are terrible human beings. So it is a critique of European intrusion into Africa as well, and we can read that. The second thing that redeems the novel for us has got nothing to do with the novel itself, but with pedagogy. Okay, so there is a whole school of scholars that I study and with whom I have worked who believe that sentimental literature can be deeply helpful in teaching our students how to develop empathy for their global others. What does he mean? What do they mean by it? That any literature that shows us the suffering of another group, even if that suffering is laced with racist language, if we mobilize it in a classroom and ask our students, right? If I asked you, you know, what do you feel about the Africans in the story? How do you think they are being treated? Obviously, as human beings, you will say, well, they're being treated terribly, right? They are dying of starvation. They are being, you know, and that, according to some scholars, is what we can mobilize in creating empathy for people whom we first see as humans, but sentimentally, we look at their suffering and say, this is wrong. So that, in that sense, then, in pedagogical theories, the sentimental content of the novel, despite its racism, can enable us to develop empathy, not you guys, but even some students who might be racist at heart. I can take the novel to them and ask them these pointed questions, right? And the research shows that even if they perform empathy to get a good grade, like even if they say, oh yes, Dr. Raja, what's being done to these guys, these African characters is terrible, right? That performative act already starts rewriting their mental schemas because the way we change our identities, social identities, is by shifting our conscious schemas. And you all know that identity is performative, right? All of you, some of you who have your cameras turned off, deeply aware of it. You don't want me to see maybe how you look or where you're sitting. Or when we go out in public, we know how are being viewed, how are being, we perform an identity different 
amongst our friends, in front of our parents, right? And in front of our professors already teaches us that identity is performative. So if you kind of convince your students to perform an empathetic identity through a work like this, chances are that it will start a chain reaction sort of in their mental schema. So these are some of the things that make the novel useful. Uh, also, it allows us to kind of read in our creative work the latent racism in language itself, which existed, let's say, in 1899 when the novel came out. So these are some of the things that we can take from a story like this, right? But absolutely, there is no denying the fact that the deep core of the novel is deeply racist, right? And you will see that when you read Achebe's speech, right? How he indicts the novel and why, right? There is a complication to his going native. Technically, when that term was used by Europeans as a, as a derisive term for other Europeans, what going native meant was that you would start wearing clothing of the natives, you will learn their language, and you'll actually go and live amongst them, eat their food, right? You didn't go native by virtue of becoming like the natives and then have a lot of guns and start shooting them, right? That wasn't considered part of going native. Going native was that you surrendered your European identity. And so a lot of your early East India Company employees who would go native was they would like go and live amongst the people, right? And they will start wearing clothes like them, eat their food, learn the language and treat the natives as equals. That was what considered going native. Now, Curtis, Curtis is going native it has a problem. The problem is that he has a lot of guns, right? So he goes native and creates a group of natives who become his followers, but then he retains his right to power. He also takes up the role of this powerful figure who has the guns and who goes and raids other villages. So there is a slight problem with that going native trope there. At the end, when, he's, when they are talking about uh, Kurtz asking him to save me, uh, there is also a reference there where he says, this lot of ivory now is really mine. The company did not pay for it. I collected it myself at a very great personal risk. I'm afraid they will try to claim it as theirs, though. Hmm. It is a difficult case. What do you think I ought to do? Resist? I want no more than justice. He wanted no more than justice. No more than justice? I rang the bell before a mahogany door on the front floor. And while I wait, so this is what he is thinking as he is knocking the door at, of his intended, of Curtis's fiance. So maybe when Curtis asked him to save him, and I save him probably could be save my valuables, save my name right? Uh, I read it more as if save my legacy. Don't let these people tarnish my name. And then here are certain documents that I'm entrusting to you. Don't give them to the company people. So that's how I read it. But good questions though. What's going on in a character's mind? So when he's talking about the steam engine and wherever he gives us some insight thought processes of the natives, they are deeply laced with the racial prejudice, right? He is assuming, he's trying to share with us in his own vocabulary, what might the engine, the steam engine come across to the native as this demon that he has to keep appeased. Now, remember, these were the terms that a lot of romantic literature about Africa also imagined. They will always give these magical explanations of natives point of view, right? And so that is deeply part of that temporality where people were writing about these native cultures, but it's also absolutely a European consciousness trying to, in a satirical or funny way, trying to share the simplistic, what they would think, understanding of machinery by the Africans. There is no 
way we can actually retrieve as to what did the Africans think about it, right? So yeah, we should read it with a grain of salt. Now that brings me to another good uh, point about the novel uh, is that, uh, is the question of the narrator, okay? Now do keep in mind that uh, Heart of Darkness is not fully a modernist novel. It's like on the cusp of being a modernist novel. So it's realist, realist fiction, almost reaching the point of modernist novel. Now, if you read any of the modernist novels like Ulysses or Epsilon Epsilon, one major concern in modernist novels is always whether or not we can trust the narrator or not. Right. So when you're reading a no modernist novel, you're looking for a secret that the novel will reveal to you. But what you're also encouraged to question is whether or not you can trust the narrator. Now here, by and large, when, when Marlowe is accounting for the factual aspects of the story, we tend to trust him. But when he becomes speculative like this, the passages that you pointed out, then we need to take it with a grain of salt. Because, I mean, we don't know what the African characters are thinking about it. And we certainly know that as a character, Marlowe will not have access to what they're thinking about it. So that's deeply speculative. Oh, okay. So experientially, absolutely. But do keep in mind that even if these people are from Africa or from India, there are certain other factors that shape their consciousness too, right? It's not just colonial history. You also will have to then look at class, right? Chances are if they are from the elite class of Kenya or like from the political elite of Nigeria, right? Their sympathies and their affiliations probably are still with the European way of looking at things. And they at times might probably even look at their own fellow Africans, right? from that point of view. So we can't really generalize a generalized colonial experience because class cuts across it. If you go to India, for example, not just class, but the region cuts across it, the politics and caste cuts across it. So like if, if you uh, go like to North India, right? And, and go to like a couple of families who are, you know, upper, rich or upper middle class Brahmins and believe in absolute truth of Hinduism, their experience of India is completely different from someone who comes from out of caste or from the Dalit community, right? Maybe people from those oppressed communities will see the racism and read it and see the struggle in it, right? Maybe people from the dominant communities will say this is how the world is. So I don't really generalize it in terms of experience, but the experience does help. Now coming to, let's say, immigrant families, second generation, third generation, I think the students, their children who are going to college and are dealing with these complexities in their real life probably will be more attuned to these kind of racial and cultural differences because of what they are exposed to in what they study, but because they are dealing with that in everyday life. So I won't say that it would naturally translate from one generation to another, but experientially, if their parents have taught them, hey, this is how we came over here. This is what happened in Ghana when, we, when it was colonized. I mean, how do we learn history? We don't inherit it, right? It is taught to us by, by the stories that our parents, our grandparents tell us. We learn it by reading. So chances are that if they are aware and if they were lucky enough to have parents who don't just tell them, you know, here you are in America, you should be grateful. You know, I mean, a lot of people do that. But rather, this is what we came from. This is what happened. This is our history. Now we need to learn from that, that so that we make sure that this kind of racism doesn't happen again, this kind of stuff doesn't happen. Now that's a more reflective way of looking at it. So to, it's a very long answer to your question. So I don't believe that we inherit these kind of subtle understandings of cultural difference, but living in a family that deals with it, that has dealt with it, and that 
teaches that to their children, the subtle differences and the latent and blatant racisms of a culture will then enable them to have that experience that would be different from anyone who comes from a dominant group and has internalized the logic of the dominant group. But even that can be complicated. I mean, look at America. Uh, if, if you think in terms of racial dominant groups, right? We cannot absolutely posit that all of them think the same way because politics cuts across it, right? If you are an extreme right-wing xenophobic person, your way of the world is completely different. If you are in the middle somewhere, despite the fact that you could be Caucasian, your views will be completely different. If you are on the left, your sympathies are already with people who are silenced and all politically. So even there, politics and class cuts across it. And that's what I encourage uh, you to think in these terms. As we conclude the novel, as I always encourage my graduate students and my undergraduate students is, I don't teach literature simply for the sake of literature, right? I try to teach it in a way that the students themselves develop the tools to look at it critically, right? But also that they take these readings, right? Get something from them and try to understand the world in which we live better, right? And develop vocabularies of resistance, vocabularies of asking questions where if they are feeling slighted, if they are feeling isolated, if they are feeling like someone is picking on them, they absolutely have the vocabulary to convince that person, this is what exactly you are doing, which is racist and which bothers me. So think of it this way. You could, like, you could start a conversation by saying, hey, with a colleague or a coworker, hey, what you just said is racist, which would immediately put them on defensive. Or you could first tell them, Look, this is what you just said to me. You're my friend. Now, let me explain to you why, from my point of view, that is hurtful and that is racist. And then you have the vocabulary to explain it, right? And when you do that, I can promise you that that person is less likely to get defensive and may even understand what you're trying to say. That is kind of something, some of kind of tools. Um, that literature can help us develop, right? And uh, because, you know, most of you are from, um, from uh, STEM program. This is our 10 years from now, you will be running the world, right? So I feel myself lucky that I'm interacting with people who are going to be leaders in so many different fields of life, right? And it's important for you all. You're so young. I've had ten students who have already, you know, they're at Stanford, they're at Yale. Some of them are at Princeton. You know, they're doing their research. They're already actively getting their degrees. And I get messages from them even now because they are now encountering real life. And they tell me sometimes that, hey, you remember we discussed this in our class. I just ran into a situation like that. And it's deeply gratifying to me, you know. Because I was like, ah, good. You know, they're actually, so that's my hope is that, you know, I teach graduate students who are already my captive audience. They're getting a PhD in literature. But interacting with you all is kind of more hopeful because you will go into so many different branches of knowledge and field. And if you can take some of these ideas with you, you know, I think it will have an impact or I hope to think so. Right. So this concludes this edited version of a live lecture. I'll be back with more and please keep an eye out for these and I hope these are useful to you. Thank you so much and as always, peace and love.